Good morning. Happy New Year. As I dangle this out of my ear. I was expecting a third, uh, fourth song, so that's why it's a little bit slow in coming up here. But uh, it is good to be with you. And um, for those of you who saw the little prayer guide, it says that Stephen Jones is meant to be preaching on prayer. Um, so I'm not Stephen Jones, and I won't be preaching on prayer. Uh, so Steve and I just switched our weeks of preaching, so he'll be preaching next week. And so we'll conclude our uh, prayer week with a sermon on prayer. Uh, so he's going to be talking about prayer. I'm going to be talking today about the Word. So if you would, open up your Bibles with me to Luke 10, 38 through 42. And it is just a good way to start out the year. It's not the only way to start out the year. But it is the first Sunday of the year, and we're going to be considering the Word of God. Not the Word of God in the sense that we're going to be preaching from the Word. We always do that. But we're going to be considering the subject or the topic of the Word, of the teachings of Jesus. So Luke 10, 38 through 42. And if you would, stand with me for the reading of Scripture. And I'm so sorry. I, I will mention, if you need a Bible, just raise your hand, and one of the ushers will get you one. We'll start reading, but you can just raise your hand if you need a Bible, and one of the ushers will be happy to get you one. Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. You may be seated as we pray. Father, we come to you the first Lord's Day in this new year, and we look to you as individuals and as a church, and we confess that we deeply and desperately need you in every way. You give us breath, and you provide for our every need. And certainly, spiritually, we can do nothing apart from your Son. And so, Father, we need you so much this morning. And so we pray that you would come and meet with us as we look to your word and as we pray and sing to you and as we participate in the Lord's Supper. We pray that by your Spirit that you would continue to meet with us and minister to us and be in our midst. And, Father, as we look to your word, I pray that you would help me to be clear and to be faithful to proclaim the truths of your word. And I pray for all of us that we would be receptive in our hearts to the things that you would have to say to us this morning. God, we need you, and we ask that you would provide for our need by your spirit, according to your grace, for your glory and for our benefit. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Luke 10, 38 through 42 is the passage that we'll be looking at. And I've entitled this morning's message, Don't Just Do Something, Sit There. Now, I have an uncle who lives and works in Japan. My uncle and I don't interact a whole ton, but we do have the opportunity to interact here and there, especially, obviously, when we visit one another. And I remember talking to him about the working culture in Japan, and I just remember noting how different it is from our context and how crazy of a work schedule that he has. So he would leave early in the morning on the train, and then he would arrive late in the evening back to his family. And in Japan, it's strange. You don't just sort of put in your hours and then go home for the day. When you leave is actually determined by when others have left the office. So it's kind of like, okay, well, who else has left already? Or has, has the boss, have my superiors left the office? And so it's a strange work culture, a bit of an honor-shame dynamic going on. And as a result of that, Japanese people are very much overworked. 
Employees log hundreds of overtime hours each year. Many companies break overtime laws that have been instituted by the Japanese government. And Japanese workers typically take a, a, a portion, only a portion of the vacation time that they're entitled to. And in fact, so prevalent is the problem of overwork in Japan that the Japanese have coined a term karoshi, which means death by overwork. And if you look at like sort of the suicide statistics in Japan and things like that, it corroborates kind of the evidence to show that this is a society that is very much overworked, very much stressed, that is very much kind of at the upper echelons of the limits of human ability in terms of being able to work. Now, the problem of overwork is not so pronounced in Canada. We don't have a term like karoshi, which means over death by overwork, but I do think that we have a busyness endemic in this nation. So the average working person or the average kind of adult is asked, how are you doing? And a typical response will be, well, I am very busy with my children, with my work, with my school, or with my extracurricular activities, or driving my kids to and fro, or whatever it is, with projects at home, with, with a home rental, or with a move, or with caring for aging parents, and, and all the rest of it. And I am busy is nearly a badge of honor in our society, a society that loves output and that is in quite a frenzy. And I'm sure that many of you feel that busyness and the stress that comes with it even this morning, and that you are at a bit of a loss of how to manage all of your commitments and all of your priorities. Now, this morning, I'm not going to be able to take your to-do list and number it for you, but I do think that there is a helpful word here from Luke 10, from the passage that we just read. And a helpful word in our busyness and the stress that comes from it. Now, in order to arrive at this helpful word, we're going to consider this scene, this narrative that Luke has given us in his gospel. And it's a scene that took place in the home of two sisters. If you go back to our text, it says in Luke 10, 38, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And as Jesus entered that village, there was a woman named Martha who would welcome him into her home. She is playing the part of a hostess, and she welcomes Christ, and likely his disciples into her home, and then she begins to prepare them a meal. And obviously, this meal is not any ordinary meal because this is not an ordinary guest. And so we have Mary and Martha. We have Martha who has gone into the kitchen, and we have Mary, who we'll see in just a moment, has gone to the feet of Christ. And this is the scene set up for us. This is where we're going to learn some lessons for us about managing the busyness of life, managing the stress of life, and understanding what truly ought to be our priorities. For the rest of our time this morning, I would like for us to consider this text under the three main characters. So if you're taking notes, we're going to look at Mary in verse 39, Martha in verse 40, and then Jesus in verses 41 and 42. Let's first look at Mary, okay? Mary is likely the younger of the two sisters. And while Martha goes into the kitchen, Mary goes to the feet of of Christ. And just so you understand, Martha is the one who is doing the culturally appropriate act. She is going into the kitchen in order to prepare and serve the food to the men. It is Mary who is doing the culturally shocking act by sitting and listening to the teachings of the rabbi. You see, because in that culture, it was a patriarchal culture. If you know your Bibles, you know this, but it was generally men that were given prestigious titles. It was men that were given the important roles, and it was only men that could be the pupils of rabbis. And so Mary is making a bold move here. She is going to the feet of this rabbi Jesus and endeavoring to hear his teaching. It was a bold move, but she must have being comfortable to do that. She must have known at least somewhere in her heart and mind that if she would do this, that Christ would not reject her and send her away. Mary was comfortable near the teacher Jesus to listen to his teaching. And in our culture, where we are told that the Bible is sexist and misogynist, I think this is an important thing for us to point out. 
Not because it's the main point of the text, but I want us to see that Jesus, in this interaction with this woman, Mary, actually goes against the grain of his culture to allow a woman to sit at his feet as his disciple. And he goes against the grain of his culture in order to restore to Mary the dignity that is hers as a human being. Jesus treated women with respect and with dignity, and we see that in this passage as well as elsewhere. Jesus allowed and allows women to be equal members of his kingdom and of his family as men. That's not revolutionary for us in the 21st century, but it certainly would have been revolutionary in the first century to the original audience. But I digress. Now, in case you missed it, Mary takes upon the posture of a disciple. She comes to the feet of Jesus as her rabbi and sits at his feet. Now, you don't need to be an expert in ancient Near Eastern culture and customs and, and, and things like this in order to understand that to sit at the feet of another implies submission. It indicates a hunger to learn. It, it communicates a desire to be taught. It says, I want to drink from the fountain of your teaching. I want to be your disciple. This is what Mary was doing. Mary was intentionally coming to the feet of Christ, sitting at his feet, listening to his teaching, and indicating a posture of submission and of a disciple. And the way that the verb is formed here, it, it wasn't just like a kind of a casual listening. It wasn't just like a, a toddler who asks you to read him a book, and then, you know, you're halfway through the book, and he says, I'm done. He's disinterested now. That this was not Mary. She was continually and intently listening to the teachings of Christ. Mary took upon herself the posture of a disciple. Let's now look at Martha. Okay, so now Martha, she gets a bit of a bad rap in um, kind of, you know, kind of, our understanding of the, of the scriptures, like in the church, like Martha is kind of a, the negative example. But remember that culturally, Martha was doing the appropriate task. She was in the kitchen preparing and serving the meal, and so it was Mary, her sister, who was actually out of line culturally, occupying a position that was reserved for the men. And then remember, too, that contextually in the book, there are many in the nation of Israel that were rejecting Jesus at this point in time. Many were rejecting Christ because of his teachings or because of his uh, miracles or because of his, the fact that he was going to head to Jerusalem to be uh, crucified on a cross. But many in Israel were rejecting Christ, and yet Mar Martha receives Jesus into her home. And so she was doing many things right. But let's just take a look at Martha and kind of try and unpack this a little bit. It says, but Martha was distracted with much serving. She was busy in the kitchen preparing an elaborate meal for her extraordinary guest. And it's not unlikely that Jesus' disciples were there also. And so Martha feels the need to prepare an elaborate meal, but she's also likely preparing a large meal. And so, of course, her sister would come to her aid. She needs to prepare an elaborate meal and likely a large meal. And so, of course, Mary would come into the kitchen and help her. And so perhaps Mary is just kind of getting the guests situated. Or, or maybe Jesus, the, the rabbi, made an interesting remark. And so she just lingered a little bit longer just to kind of see what he would say. And then she would come to the kitchen. But... As Martha gets deeper and deeper into the meal prep, and as her stress levels rise as a result of her sister not coming and her delaying longer and longer, Mar Martha all of a sudden has something to say. And what she has to say is not to marry her sister, but actually to Jesus. And those words are recorded for us in verse 41. It says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone, then tell her to help me. Now, I just want to make a few observations about Martha's statement. Martha is clearly frustrated with her sister. Number two, Martha is slightly irritated that Jesus has not corrected her sister. 
Number three, Martha in her mind is doing the correct thing. Number four, Mary in Martha's mind is doing the mistaken thing. Number five, according to Martha, it would have been better for Mary to be cutting onions in the kitchen than doing whatever she was doing in that moment. So we're just trying to observe Mary, and we're trying to observe Martha, and I'm just trying to kind of make some observational comments, and we're going to allow Jesus to be the judge of all of this in just a moment. We're going to look at his evaluation of the two sisters in just a moment, but I want us to come back to this word distracted. Look with me to verse 40. It says, that, but Martha was distracted with much serving. That word distracted means to be pulled away or dragged away. Metaphorically then, to have one's attention directed from one thing to, one, to another, to be distracted, busy, or overburdened. And I'm sure that many of you feel that way this morning, that you are busy, that you are distracted, and that you are pulled in every direction and as a result overburdened. And we've had a bit of a reprieve with Christmas and the break, but it's the new year, vacation is coming to an end, schools are starting up, and it's going to be full tilt yet again. And maybe there's a bit of a Martha spirit in you. Well, if I don't do this, nobody else will. And certainly, if it's going to be done right, then I need to be the one to do it. I need to finish that project at work. That deadline for that assignment is fast approaching. I need to register my kids in this sport and that program and then play chauffeur to them. I need to volunteer my, at my kids' school. I need to make a meal plan and go grocery shopping and then cook and then subject myself to the harshest of critics, my husband and my children. I need to complete my bathroom reno. I need to clean my bathroom. I need to organize the garage. I need to give that presentation at work. I need to study for that exam. I need to read my Bible. I'm already behind. It's only January 2nd. I didn't know that was possible, but I'm already behind in my Bible reading for the year. I need to get that stack of books that keep staring at me, or I need to get to reading them. I need to call my parents and my siblings. I haven't talked to them in ages. I need to witness to my neighbor. I need to be involved at church and serve more. And God, if I could just get a bit of help with my never-ending to-do list, that sure would be nice. Now, if you've read your Bibles, if you've grown up in the church, or you're familiar with this account, you know where this is going. But let me ask you individually a question. Honestly, which of the sisters best captures you this morning? Which of the sisters and their heart and the state of their heart captures you best this morning? The calm, quiet, and listening Mary, or the frazzled, busy, and fussing Martha? We need this passage today. We are addicted to busy. We, are, we measure value by output, and we idolize productivity. And yet Christ, our Lord, says that there is a better way, and this is where I would like to spend some time for the, for the rest of our sermon. So if you're taking notes, Jesus in verses 41 and 42. Now, it says, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. You are anxious and troubled about many things. And, and just, just to note, I, I think I'm, I'm capturing this correctly, is that the tone of Jesus here is, is one of tenderness and kindness. This is not a harsh rebuke. This is a gentle correction. You see, Christ loves Martha. And Christ wants what is best for her. And so this is not a, a harsh rebuke to us as Christians if we've got our priorities a little bit out of alignment. I want you to hear the tenderness and the kindness of Jesus to speak to you in a matter that it would tell you what is best for you. So Jesus goes on to acknowledge her situation and the state of her heart. It says that she is anxious and she is troubled, which is a reference to internal worry and external agitation. And one of the things that I would just like for us to know, just as an observation, at least for Martha and I think for us, is that one of the byproducts 
of being distracted with much serving and busyness is this internal anxiety and this agitation in one's life. And so to put it this way, when you're not anchored in your soul by the one thing that is necessary and you're distracted by the many things that are not ultimately necessary, then you are actually inviting anxiety and trouble into your heart. Jesus says, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. And in this entire thing, there's only one thing really said of Mary, and that is that she sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his word or listened to his teaching. And so clearly then, the one thing that is necessary for her, for Martha, and for Christians down through the ages is that we would have a posture and a practice of regularly sitting at the feet of Jesus to listen to his word. This is the one thing that is necessary then and now for Mary and for Martha and for you and for me. The question is, church, here and online, do you desire the good portion? Do you desire the calmness and the serenity of Mary? Do you desire to pursue the things which Christ would have you value above all else? And do you desire to be free from the anxiety and agitation of Martha? And if you do, then as individuals and as a body, we must have this posture and practice of humbly listening to the words of Jesus and allowing those words to shape us as a people. And just to be clear, this does not simply mean that we check off the marks on our Bible reading plan. And it doesn't simply mean that we come here on a Sunday and listen passively to the sermon. You know, it means that we approach the word with all humility and all submission, with the expectation that Christ would actually speak to us through his word, with a desire that he would shape us and that his gospel would anchor us. So in that vein, then, let me just ask some diagnostic questions. Fathers, who has the loudest voice in your home? Elders, whose words ring loudest in your ears as you lead this church christian whose wisdom most shapes the way you think young person who has the strongest influence on the way that you view the world and mabc whose voice do we want to hear above all other voices in our midst and i hope that our response is christ christ and only christ we need his voice to be loudest above all other voices, that is what God requires, and that is what is best for us. Now, while we're on the subject of Christ, in the book of Luke, we are told that he has set his face to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was the capital of Israel, and Jerusalem was significant, obviously, in the Christ story, because it would be the place in which he was put on trial and executed by crucifixion. And it was because of his determination to go to Jerusalem that many in his day would have rejected him. But either way, he would go on and he would march towards Jerusalem. And he would be hung on the cross to die a sinner's death. And he would be raised on the third day to conquer death. And then listen, after he rose, he would spend some time with his disciples, and he would be teaching them. And foremost in his heart, and foremost on his lips, during that time was the message concerning him, the message of salvation for the forgiveness of sins for all the nations of the world. Foremost on Christ's heart. And the primary subject of his teaching was that forgiveness of sins could be offered to the nations by virtue of his suffering and his rising. And you could have this forgiveness, anybody could have this forgiveness, if you would repent and believe. And so if you're here this morning, or you're listening online, or at some point you catch this message on YouTube, and you can identify with this busy lifestyle... 
And you can identify with the anxiety and the stress that comes from such busyness. Jesus' solution for you is not that you would try harder. His solution for you is not that you would engage in some resting regimen. It's, it's not even some sort of a mindfulness exercise. No, the solution for you is to find life and salvation, peace and rest in this gospel message, which lies at the heart of his teaching for the world. That you would find in him, through his teaching, a gracious master and a caring savior. And that above all, you would find peace and happiness for your souls in him. You see, the teaching of Christ is not just how we ought to live. But the teaching of Christ contains the gospel in which it grants to us forgiveness and pardon of our sins against the holy God. His teaching includes the message of him dying and rising on behalf of sinners like you and me so that we can have hope, joy, and rest and peace in him. Now, I want to conclude our sermon by going to a bit of a strange spot I want, I want to conclude our sermon by providing a clarification to answer a question that you might have been asking. You see, because our text creates a bit of a tension. If listening to the teaching of Jesus is my highest priority, am I just to read my Bible all day and listen to sermons all day long? What about my other priorities in life? What about doing good deeds and practically serving others? Is this text... the is calling us to a monastic lifestyle, to a life primarily of contemplation and meditation with little participation in the world and practical matters. And, and in fact, this is how the Middle Ages took this text. The, Middle, the, the church in the Middle Ages took this text to mean that we shall value the contemplative life over and above the active and serving one. But I don't think that this text is calling for Meditation on the Bible to the exclusion of serving and practical works. But rather, it is teaching us not to allow the busyness of serving to crowd out the most essential thing. I want to try and tie all this together by going to 19th century England. In the city of Bristol in the 19th century, in the 1800s, was a man by the name of George Mueller. He was a pastor in that city, and incidentally, one of our own, Judy Loveless, many of you know Judy, uh, her parents were actually sent out as missionaries to India from George Mueller's church, so that's just a connection with our local body here. But Mueller was an absolute workhorse for the gospel, and if you've heard of the name George Mueller, one of the things that you probably know about him is that he started these orphanages, orphanages in the city of Bristol. He would open five orphan homes in his lifetime, and he would care for 10,024 children over the course of his ministry. But it wasn't just the orphanages that he started. He founded the Scripture Knowledge Institute for Home and Abroad, and in a report that he gives, these are some of the statistics. 16,500 children and adults were taught the Bible in various schools support, supported by the institution. Roughly 45,000 copies each of the Old Testament and New Testament were distributed in various languages. 31 million tracts and books also in various languages were dispersed. The Institute supported foreign missions work and of late years had sent out 120 uh, 20 workers. And then in addition, Mueller pastored the same church for over 66 years. And it is estimated that he preached at least 10,000 times in his lifetime. When he turned 70, as a retirement plan, he would become a missionary. And over the next 17 years, he would visit 42 countries, preaching an average of once a day. Mueller was a workhorse for the gospel. He was busy. He was zealous for good works. He had a massive output. So how is it that a man like that could embody a passage like ours? How could a man who is so busy and so active listen attentively to the teaching of Jesus. I want you to hear from Mueller's own lips what for him was first priority, even amidst all that ministry. And it is a bit of a long quote, so you have to kind of bear with me, but, but here is the quote. The point is this, 
I saw more clearly than ever that the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend to every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. The first thing to be concerned about was not how much I might serve the Lord or how I might glorify the Lord. Mueller goes on to say, you know, I could evangelize the lost. I could help believers. I could relieve the distressed. But if his soul is not happy in God, then he could perform all those acts, but they would not be done with the right spirit, much like Martha was in our passage. And then he says this, the first thing I did after a brief prayer, this is in the mornings, this is what he would do this, was to begin to meditate on the word of God, searching, as it were, into every verse to get blessings out of it, not for the sake of public ministry of the word, not for the sake of preaching on what I had meditated upon, but for the sake of obtaining food for my own soul. Now, what is food for the inner man? Not prayer, but the word of God. And here again, not the simple reading of the word of God so that it only passes through our minds just as water runs through a pipe, but considering what we read, pondering over it, and applying it to our hearts. Now, it is out of that kind of posture and practice of sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to his word that our souls can be satisfied. And once that first priority is established, when the one thing that is necessary is not neglected, then we are ready to serve him even as Mueller was. And so MABC, as we approach 2022 with all that lies ahead of us, with all of the uncertainty, with surely all of the ups and downs, with continuing challenges that come with COVID and the restrictions and Omicron and all the rest of it, in all our busyness, with all our tasks and all our activities and all our service to him. I would propose and I would urge us to have, that we would have this posture and practice as a matter of first priority uh, on our own and together as a church to listen humbly and eagerly to his teaching and to his word. This is what we need above all else. This is what Christ says out of his own lips is a matter of first priority. And so if we are Christians, if we are disciples of Christ, then we ought to be a people both individually and corporately who prioritize and who facilitate and who prize and value sitting at his feet humbly to receive his word. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time that we have this morning. We all desperately need to hear reminders to prioritize your son and to feast on his word. And so I pray that this would set for us just a bit of a trajectory as a church, that we would be a people on our own and together as a body, who listen to the teaching of your son. Who listen to your, the teaching of your son to the point where it forms and shapes us at a deep level and in a deep way. Father, you are good. You are kind to us. We thank you for this morning. We pray that you'd help us to live out these truths that we have just spoken of. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.